So I see it's a I see it's a gorgeous day outside, but I want to assure everyone that this is a it's a really important panel and uh, really excited to moderate it. You know, I've, I've been investing in private credit for quite a while. I think, you know, I think there's three reasons that I think this panel should be important to the really sophisticated audience that we have here as well as virtually. You know, one of the things I've learned is that over the last 10 years with the story of what, what has happened to the banks, uh, private credit, especially direct lending, is no longer a niche alternative asset class. It's really a sector of the American economy. Um, you know, second, I think for, from, from our perspective, it's really the only way that we can get an illiquidity premium, which is, which is really, you know, how we can make money in fixed income these days, given where rates and spreads are. But I think the third thing that at least I've learned is that to do this right, it's not as easy as it looks. And it's really not a desktop underwriting type of business. It's really a people business. And so with that, you know, just want to again introduce uh, two of the most important people in this business, which are uh, Kip uh, and Mark. So uh, thanks, Kip and Mark, for joining us and for allowing me to Thank you. this panel. So I'm just going to start with uh, probably the only the, the only macro question that I have on my agenda, which is uh, the banks. So we've heard what's happened with the banks. You know, after the great financial crisis, they are not taking risk and continue to not take risk the way they they did back in the old days. The so-called velocity of money that connects the Federal Reserve to the economy is potentially broken. But my question is more looking to the future. Are the banks ever going to take risk again? Um, Kip, I'll ask you that first. I mean, I think the banks definitely do take risk, but I mean, we'll try to keep this to illiquid credit, direct lending, corporate, and maybe asset-based as well. The reality is their businesses were forced to change substantially during the GFC, right? So um, materially deleveraged, moved into much more of a large cap, you know, high grade business. Right. So I, I do think the banks take risk. They just take less risk than they used to in most of the activities that they're in. So I mean, when you think about corporate direct lending, many years ago, would they underwrite and you know, own middle market loans? They would. They don't do that anymore. Instead, what do they do? They actually come in and lend folks like Mark and our businesses a lot of money up the capital structure as a wholesale funder of our business. Right. If we're putting leverage on our assets, They'll do it in a way that's more efficient for them in terms of cost of capital and in something that they can leverage into good ROE for them being leveraged 10 to 1 instead of 40 to 1. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know if you have anything yeah, to add, no, Mark. I, but. I think it's well said. I would say that you know, on, on top of that, it's, it's something that's been happening for a long time, right? They figured out that from their point of view, the business model of turning over the capital, underwrite, turn it over, underwrite, turn it over, was simply a better model. We're all in the long term buy and hold business, uh, and they've chosen to be in the moving business. And it doesn't make one right or wrong, but I recall starting in, in private equity 1995, and this was already beginning, you know, this movement from holding loans to selling loans, and of course it accelerated as Kip said. Yeah, that's very helpful. So I wanted to just talk about, so this is more of an academic question. You know, you can think of direct lending as you know, we're, we're never going to have any losses. We're underwriting for a, a zero loss type of projection. Or you can think of it in a different way that we fully expect to have a certain amount of losses and we're baking that into the spread that we're charging. So it's two different mentalities. Not, one may not be better than the other. Um, how do you, maybe Mark, we'll start with you. How do you think about that? I don't know if one's better or worse than the other, but I yeah. can say we're firmly planted in one. We have yeah. a strong view that every credit we underwrite, we're underwriting to get paid back yeah. and to get paid back, hopefully, with limited volatility between here and there. You know, I think the idea, of course, it's mathematically true that you can get paid a spread to compensate for expected level of losses. And of course, there will be losses. But I think in direct lending, at least for us, it's kind of an insidious slope when you start saying, well, I'll get paid for it. How, how can you possibly get paid enough? Take a loan. Remember, we own large positions for the long term. So it's not, okay, that didn't work. I'll trade out of it at 94. You own it. And I think owning in direct lending would mean if, you, if, if you're if you wrong to that degree, how do you get compensated? We have an internal expression, which is we say, it's okay to be wrong by 25 basis points. It's not okay to be wrong by 25 points. Mm -hmm. And so for us, it's a zero loss mentality on each credit. Um, but of course, we recognize there'll be losses. You know, that, that said, 
know, since inception at this point across our platform, we've had a realized loss rate of five basis points. So it's been a great environment. Don't mean to suggest otherwise, but but it can be done in terms of really trying to pick your credits. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I totally agree with you. I think to try to answer your question, I, I think about needing to run that specific business both ways. So to Mark's point, when you're sitting with your investment committee in an underwriting, right, and you're talking about a new deal, you're underwriting that with parameters that you think are creating no losses. Does it ever work that way? Of course not, right? So when you think about how you actually run the business, how do I finance myself? What do the liabilities look like? Do I have permanent capital? Do I have long duration capital? You know, I, I, I want as long duration capital as I can possibly have against these assets, right? I, I can't handle redemptions, upset investors who want their money back if we're in a period like the GFC or during COVID, right? We need to be able to actually put our asset management resources against difficult situations and resolve them. Yeah. And we've got a very long history of being able to do that. And like um, the folks at Mark's firm, we, we have a 0%, virtually 0% loss rate against 100 plus billion of capital invested over the last 17 years. Yeah. And we're not always right, <laughs> right in our investment committees, but we know what to do when things don't go the way that we expect them to go. Yeah. So it's, for me, it's a little bit of both. You know, just one, I appreciate it's not the, the origin of the question, but Kip just mentioned something really interesting and Aries really led the way on this, which is the ability to use investment grade unsecured debt as part of the whole direct evolution of the direct lending model is really significant. Now it's peculiar and unique to BDCs, right? Funds can't really be IG issuers. So it's one of the actually many benefits, I'm sure who would agree to the, the BDC structure, but being able to issue that unsecured long-term debt, it does two things. One is obviously that gives you a very long maturity without any meaningful covenants, but it also frees up the rest of the collateral to do these bank financings that yeah. depending on the moment you're doing them, they're generally available with the banks, but harder or easier. Yeah. It's a pretty interesting feature of the way the markets develop. Yeah. Funds, funds are using relevering as well, right? But you're saying that's just a little bit different than what you're seeing with the senior unsecured. Well, it's pretty banks. different because being able to issue a bond in the in the marketplace yeah. and an unsecured bond at that, it's yeah. pretty different from, because we all use bond balance sheet financings, traditional yeah. drop downs or yeah. you know, CLL structured financings or revolvers, but all of those things in some way you know, are, are secured facilities. They're great and they're usually available, but having cushion in your system, yeah. having that flexibility and that duration that Kip you know, referred to, very powerful. Yeah, whether whether it's a public fund or a private fund, right? When we, when we have a private fund that we will put modest amounts of leverage against, think one times or less on a senior loan fund, materially less than that on a multi-asset fund, we insist on the liability structure being as long duration as we expect the assets to be. Yeah. And the reason is because you can't be a forced seller of these assets because there's a terrible market if you're a forced seller. Yeah. And I mean, I just think back to the financial crisis. We were, and I, I tell people these anecdotes, we were buying performing bank loans from managers who had liquidity problems, middle market names that no one knew that were performing, i.e. they were paying current interest at 60 cents on the dollar because literally they were unwinding short-term credit facilities, TRS, where they were using the wrong financing to yeah. you know, be a tourist in these asset classes. And yeah. I, I wish that still existed. It kind of doesn't anymore, but yeah. it was really easy 10 or 11 years ago doing that. And one of the ways that we got, we got through, but the, the whole industry of private credit has learned a lot of lessons. And, it's, and to Mark's point is we've gotten bigger. Yeah. We have tools that we've been able to use to be better investors and to deliver better performance. And I think the top yeah. managers in the space understand how to not only be as right as you possibly can in your investment yeah. committees, but also use all the other tools that are available to you. Yeah, and, and that was actually my next uh, question is just moving to the, the, the everyday, you know, what tools do you use to protect downside protection? But maybe just to, to nuance it a little bit, I think both of your firms are involved in not only first lien lending, but also second lien lending. And second lien is potentially a little bit different vantage point. So what tools do you use and how do you contrast between first and second? Maybe. Kip, do you want to do you want to start first? On that? Yeah, sure. I mean, we've we've been basically running the same business. You know, a couple of um, us that really started at Aries doing this for twenty years. We're huge believers in the flexibility of the approach in terms of capital. Right. We think it drives better originations. We think it allows you to you know play markets differently. I.e., if you want to be defensive, you know, you can be more first lien oriented. And if things are a bit more opportunistic, you can take more risk and hopefully make more returns. So yeah. 
you know, I've gotten asked this question a lot as the CEO of a public VDC and folks sort of try to poke holes in us investing in second lien. And they're like, why don't you just invest in first lien? And the answer is because there isn't enough rate of return investing just in first lien to do that to accomplish what our investors are looking for, right? So beyond what I think the benefits of the business are, when you look at both, you know, they're, they're very different risks because you're getting paid a very different return to own one versus the other. So I'd say we're more selective in our second lien and junior capital investing. We tend to do it during more opportunistic periods in the cycle, i.e. not now. Um, <laughs> And we tend to do it in larger companies where we think there's inherently more franchise value, more enterprise value cushion. Yeah. And Mark, how about you? Yeah, we're, you know, we're, well, we're heavily first lean oriented just yeah. in terms of the way our books have been built. But absolutely echo the thought. I, I would say I think it's actually a bit of misdirection, misunderstanding in the private lending market. There's nothing inherently better about any old first lean versus any old second lean, right? This is back to the question you asked. How do you underwrite? Yeah. It's really the core question. The structure, of course, is part of that question, but we have ample number of second liens that I am confident are stronger credits. Right. Hopefully they'll all work out as others have and they'll all get paid back and there'll be no distinction, but are stronger credits inherently than some of the first liens. So having that flexibility and not being locked into when there are people that are, I only do first lien. I don't, I'm not really sure why. You know, if you take our second lien book, for example, our overall lending book, the average EBITDA in our portfolio is about $100 million. These are pretty big companies. The average EBITDA in our second lien book is $200 million. Right. And it's the same for us. Yeah, so it's, yeah. so it's a really- if, if not more, Apples frankly. to oranges in a way, right? So yes, yeah, second lien in a really big franchise business with a really big equity check, uh, depends. Yeah. So when you think about the, the competitive environment and when you think about macro, micro, what are the most exciting opportunities that you see today in direct lending? Uh, Mark, maybe if, if, if you wouldn't mind starting with that. Sure. Look, it's a, um, it is a tremendous market. I know this is hard to do without it sounding like an ad, um, but, but it's a tremendous market for direct lending. And it's, it's kind of simple. It's a function of extraordinary levels of activity in private equity with really great firms, many of whom are here today. I was talking to our friends from Toma Bravo. I mean, they're just incredible organizations buying great companies and that you know, sort of feeds into our system. And because multiples have gone up, at some point there's only so much leverage you can tolerate. So the great contrast, and therefore I think the source of the great opportunity is the scaling of opportunities and the velocity. I was making this up, looking, looking earlier today, this morning I think we just did our 10th billion dollar financing that we were a part of, um, that we committed to or did I think today. When we started the firm, there'd never been one. Right, and then everyone talked about the one that existed for years. So you know that when you do that math, it just suggests there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. And these are good companies. Like there's a, yeah. as opposed to adverse selection, there's favorable <laughs> selection. Right, get ever bigger companies as a lender. That's a good place to be because someone's going to buy that business even if it gets in trouble. And just to challenge you on that yeah. a little bit, they didn't go to the leveraged loan market. Right. No. And and that is also I think part of what's been revealed through this time, which is of course it's more expensive to use yeah. private capital. Of course the documents, documents indeed are more restrictive. However, you know to me there's the I call it the three P's. Right there's the idea of 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 privacy, which is you know, it's private equity for a reason. Like we're trying to take the company's private, do work and return. If otherwise I'm with rating agencies and reporting quarterly, I'm back where I started. Predictability. Knowing the money will be there on terms certain. I did buyouts myself for over 20 years. It doesn't, the last 50 basis points of a loan that's part of your cap stack that'll last for two years, it doesn't make any difference to call to return. But 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 on the other hand, knowing what it will be when the day comes matters. And then partnership, and this is the one the pandemic I think most revealed, which was at the end of the day, knowing who to call and have a conversation like we all did 25 years ago with banks is very powerful. And embedded in our products is an insurance policy effectively which is you know who you're going to talk to to deal with the unknown. And we just went through the most unknowable, unpredictable period. Yeah. Done right, you can navigate that well. If your debt's <clears> scattered <throat> to the winds and now it's in the hands of people that have a different agenda or CLOs, or it's nothing wrong with CLOs, but they have different mandates from yeah. what we have, you don't have choices. So I think there's embedded insurance policy that you know, you're paying partly for, and yeah. I think it's proved to be quite a return for people. Yeah, that's great. And from an Aries perspective, what are the most exciting areas out there? And I'm, I'll just combo yeah, that I'll, with the next question. What are the most challenging areas? Yeah, I mean, there? I'll take it a slightly different direction, agreeing with everything Mark said, which is 
it, it, they come and go much more quickly than they used to. Yeah. Right. The market is is sometimes really attractive doing large unit tranches and private equity transactions, you know, many of which we've done with you guys and others, right? Um, sometimes it's really attractive to be doing non-sponsored deals in pick your injury, you know. So what we've focused on is really saying we have unbelievably flexible capital. We have the capacity to finance companies that have as little as 10 million of EBITDA and probably have as much as 500 million of EBITDA on a private basis. We have a very large spots for coverage team where we you know, literally network with 500 plus global private equity firms. We've built you know, an oil and gas team, a power and project finance team, life sciences and healthcare team, tech, software and service. So for me, it's just all about the breadth of how much we can see because the sad reality is being selective is hard in the relationship business. We say yes, like four or 5% of the time and to drive the amount of investing that we want to do and that our investors want to get on board with us doing, we need to see a lot of deal flow. And it, it really shifts very quickly where something like COVID came along and, you know, I don't see Orlando out there, but, you know, we did a deal. We both, I think, do a lot of business with the Tom Bravo guys. You know, they, they came to us and they said, we want to buy one of your, you know, we, we thought the private equity lending business was getting very difficult going into COVID, very competitive, et cetera. And all of a sudden COVID came and he said, you guys have a portfolio company, you know, that we're buying and we don't know how to finance it other than just ask you guys to finance it. And obviously we got, I hope he's not in the audience, you know, substantially off market, <laughs> you know, terms in our favor at that point. We've of course since been refinanced, but it, it just, it shifts a lot more quickly than, yeah. than it used to. And yeah. just having the broadest pipeline that we can possibly yeah. have is, is our biggest advantage. Yeah. Excuse me. So just want to bring in a specific sector, which I know Mark is, uh, is important to your firm. Um, technology sector, I'll share my very limited knowledge and about, you know, potentially under levered companies, software companies have high profit margins, recurring customers, you know, uh, you know, from a generic perspective, it looks like a great place to lend to. Obviously, they're in industries that traditionally have been disrupted over time or, or in this case been disruptive. And so there's some risk there. How do you think about technology? Yeah, it's been an area of, of keen focus for us for yeah. quite a while. We have a very large dedicated technology fund, PDC, uh, as well as platform that surrounds it. And you said it spot on. You know, I think the misunderstanding we had over years now was people thinking we're, we're going there to make higher returns. Now it happens we have. We've, we've been able to generate teens returns, taking what amounted to, in our view, and mathematically, no risk. Um, and of course, it's risk, but none that's been realized. And um, you know, the reason we went there is because it's safer. For the reasons you described, you have recurring customer relationships, you have recurring revenue, all the things that the insights a decade ago were brought to the table by the tech-focused and growth-focused firms. Everything about that you like, you're going to like more as a lender because you're not paying 25 times EBITDA. Back to this earlier point, this is a great example of where leverage caps out. So in, in the software book, we probably on average are below 35% loan to value. So, you know, is someone going to be wrong 65% before you get $1 of impairment? I mean, anything's possible, but I can tell you that in our tech BDC, for example, we haven't had a single loan, forget default, in arrears. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, for us, it's a very large sector. It's been our best performing sector, I think, probably okay. for you guys too. And the argument is simple, um, which is you've got recurring revenue, you've got stable demand, it's not cyclical. But the reason it's not is because most of the tech deals that we're doing are not particularly high tech, right? We're talking about, you know, ERP software running facilities management for, you know, company XYZ, you know. You're talking about things that that literally can't be taken away from an operating company, i.e. I'm selling you software as a service. Yeah. You can't uninstall it from your business or you can't run your business, right? It's the lion's share of most of the tech investing happening. I don't think there's a lot of disruptive technology that we're lending to generally. That's, that's really interesting. Um, I think we, we talked about sponsors before. You know, can, you, can you talk about how you think about sponsor relationships and the types of sponsors that you like having long-term relationships with and why, or maybe the types that you don't, that are not appropriate for your type of business model? Kip, maybe if you could start with that. Ooh, yeah. Um, so, I mean, we, we grew up as a sponsor coverage organization. So I'd say we have probably, you know, some of the longest and best standing sponsor relationships out there. And look, we take a lot of pride in the fact that, you know, we have done deals with someone that have not gone well. 
Yeah. And most of those relationships remain intact, if not better, right? So the, the standard contract between lending to private equity and private equity is we put in half the money as lenders, you put in half the money as equity investors, we have asymmetric risk to the downside, i.e. we can lose all our money and get a coupon, you have asymmetric return <laughs> opportunity to the upside, and we've granted that. So the only part of the contract that's really important is that when things don't go well, that they support it with money and operational resources, right? I mean, that for us is at the end of the day, really what it's all about, hard stop. I mean, we, we tend to have better relationships and longer relationships with folks that we like. And I'm fortunate in the, the sponsor coverage team that rolls up to us, you know, is generally a bunch of folks who've been together a long time and have really long relationships with private equity partners and great firms that we like. But but if you boil it all down, it's 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 really down to that first and foremost. Yeah. And, you know, look, COVID and other times in my career, you have to have difficult conversations sometimes with private equity, which is this is the way the business works. You can either support the company or we'll own the company, I guess. It's not our preference, but we have the ability and the resources to do that. And the onus is on them to do their job. And for the most part, we get the right result. And I'd say during COVID, unbelievable performance, I think, from the private equity community to support their businesses mm -hmm. during what clearly was a you know, really difficult six month interim period that they're largely you know, seeing in the rearview mirror now. Yeah. And, and private and, equity, you know, yet again, proved the durability of the private equity model. Right. And that is the contract, the compact that, that Kip just referred to, which I think is very powerful. And maybe some people view it as ethereal, but it's not, right? We can see it empirically. Same thing happened during the, the financial crisis. Yeah. I, I sat in meetings with LPs, they said, well, you're gonna lose 50 cents on the dollar. I mean, those funds all turned into you know, net positive return funds, even the yeah. ones like at the, the, done at the darkest hour before yeah. the, you know, the, the great crash. So yeah. I think that is really the key. The, I think the thing we look for that I would add to that, that very articulate list is people who value what we offer. That is to say, remember mm -hmm. those three P's for I was sure. talking about. We're looking for people that will pay for that because it's worth it. If they don't think it's worth it, if they don't think the privacy, the partnership, and the predictability are worth it, we're really probably not the right answer because we yeah. do want to get alpha. We do want to get paid for that is part of our value proposition. Yeah. But you really, we talk about comp. I love, I mean, I've, I've spent 20 years talking to private equity guys about how the 25 basis points is not impactful to their return. And we have enough senior level relationships that, you know, at investment committee, we'll just say, can you just go back and tell them that the LIBOR 650 versus LIBOR 625 actually doesn't matter? Yeah. And to choose who they want to work <laughs> with because we're done iterating right. in this meaningless right. circle, you know? So, and, I think and, it's, it's. And have you seen, I mean, some, some, direct lending firms have a value slant in terms of the sponsors that they're choosing, that those sponsors invest in value-oriented companies, lower multiples. Are you, are you seeing that in, on, in your business or are you, you know, you're investing with all types of sponsors? Well, we, we certainly are uh, interested and do work with all types of sponsors. Okay. However, I will say as a firm, our disposition has always been toward credit protection. That leans us toward you know, high quality companies, back to this point about durability when things yeah. go wrong. You know, Kip articulated well the, the ambition we all have to make sure that we're seeing a broad range and at different moments, different things might look more appealing. But yeah. I'll say from a Blue Owl point of view, you know, within that, that properly said range, we really focus on larger companies, leaders, number one, number two in their market. And it's all about the downside. It's all about if something goes wrong, am I going to get my money back? And if you have a large market leader, someone's going to buy that company. And remember, we don't want to conduct a fire sale, but if you have to conduct a fire sale, if you're 50% yeah. or less loan to value, you're largely going to get your money back, which is what yeah. makes the business durable. Yeah. And what about non-sponsored deals? You know, there's, just, there's sponsored deals, non-sponsored deals potentially offer higher spread, potentially offer you know, other, other benefits. Um, is, that, is that an area of focus for you guys? I mean, it, it's always been an area of focus. I'd say it's an increasing area of focus. We've been thought of, I think, a long time as a sponsor-only business, which is not yeah. the truth. But I think it's just because we've done so much lending yeah. um, to private equity over the years. Old days, call it five, 10 years ago, probably 10, 20% of our portfolio was non-sponsored. Yeah. And it was just stuff that, that came in because of the Aries platform and because of the network and the brand. Right. It comes in from bankers. It comes in from financial advisors, from tax accountants, from private bankers, whoever it is. 
we finally put a dedicated team against that origination effort because it is important. The way we think about it is it's riskier because you don't have that compact or that contract with private equity. You're coming into a transaction typically in that regard as the only institutional investor, typically with a family or an entrepreneur. And you're getting higher pricing and you're probably getting lower leverage, but with it, you're getting the responsibility of being private equity-like in your relationship with the company. So yeah. it's inherently just different. And Mark, how, would you, how do you think about non-sponsored? Uh, we have an active non-sponsored business, but I, I think that's well described. I would say that another thing to me about direct lending, you know, the Blue Owl and, and areas aside, I think there are these sort of um, statements that are made generically that I, I don't think hold. It all gets down to the specifics. <laughs> You know, oh, non-sponsor. Well, that's going to be you know better terms than than sponsor. I hear the one that, that most catches my attention is lower middle market. You can get better returns. That's just false. Right. <laughs> it's just flat false. So, you know, the idea that by category one is better than the other, I think it's down to the, the specifics. And is there someone behind it to support it? Do they have the operational capability? And indeed, you can get compensated for some of those incremental risks. They have to be pretty incremental. Back to the point of not taking impairment risk. We have some great non-sponsor loans we make. Love it. Yeah. But it all gets down to the particulars of the company yeah. and the owner. It doesn't really matter if we quote call it a sponsor or a non-sponsor. Yeah, I think I think a lot of that is, you know, the the late cycle behavior of pursuing kind of the niche that felt like you found something. Right? This is this is not a complicated business at all. I mean, there's certain things that you need to do to do it well, but I promise there's no like, you know, pot of gold at the end of some rainbow that you're gonna find, right? That it's a trillion and a half dollar market, it's well developed. That's typically, I think, gone away through COVID, right? I think folks like Blue Owl, like Aries, have actually seen more allocators, LPs, et cetera, come back to us and say, we used to say you guys were too big and we didn't think you could generate alpha and actually we're realizing that the scale is an advantage, that you weren't lying to us. Actually, your portfolios are performing better than other people's. We're not doing any of these niche things we were looking for anymore. We want to just allocate more into the stuff that you're doing. And, and you guys and five or 10 other people, but it is, it is probably five to 10 people right That's now great. that really, I think, control that market. That's great. So fi final question for me, and then we'll turn it over to the audience and maybe take as many questions as we can in the time. I I'm sorry, I'm hearing that. Are we out of time? Okay. Okay, this will be the last question. Um, I so I, I'm looking at the audience questions here. How do you broadly define private credit and is direct lending becoming crowded? I think we have actually answered those. So I, I feel good that we didn't ignore them. Last question for me is the pandemic. How did it affect your portfolio and how does it affect your underwriting going forward, if at all? Uh, Kip, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, that? I think, you know, we, uh, Mark made this comment about your platform. I think the same is true, true for us. Part of the reason we're consolidating, I think, more market share coming out of this downturn is we proved that we were a reliable, well-run partner for people, right? So um, some of it was good underwriting, good credit selection. Some of it was how we represented ourselves in difficult situations, i.e. amendments. Some of it was the fact that we were actually open for business doing new deals when no one else, not many people were. Yeah. Um, funding revolvers, funding delayed draws, no financing problems, you know, uh, just looked rock solid the whole way. I think um, obviously we had problems in the portfolio, right? When businesses close for 60 or 90 days and have no revenue, you've got some things to go figure out. Um, but I think we're emerging again, much stronger, which we typically have historically through downturns and COVID's no different. Yeah, I, at the end of the day, I think what the pandemic demonstrated honestly is the, is the power of the partnership model, I mean, the ability to navigate uncertain waters together to a mutually beneficial outcome. And if we can do that, again, you can get paid for that, right? As an investor, long dated capital, as a, as a as GP allocating that capital, you can get paid for the power of that partnership. And I think the pandemic demonstrated that to a lot of users. I can safely say there are very many big firms, wonderful firms that never really use the private market. Part of it might've been scale, which is, Kip said, there's a few of us that become very large and now can meet those needs. But even that aside, there was sort of, well, I'll just go to the public markets. That's what I'm used to doing. And the pandemic, I think, showed, because we were financing things in the darkest days of the pandemic, great companies, but there was no public market. Yeah. And I think it demonstrated to people, hey, you know what, this market actually works for me. And so people, even now in what is undoubtedly an ebullient market, are still selecting the private alternative. 
That's great. Well, uh, thanks. Are we, are we at, truly out of time, Russell? Okay. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Thank you.